<laughs> All right, what's up, guys? We have Steven Kruger here. He is a he has a, a sci-fi podcast. He's also an executive producer of TV shows and a writer of TV shows. So what's going on? Hey, what's Steven? going on, guys? Hey, what's going on? Can yes, you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I was born in Newton, Massachusetts. And then I moved to Hollywood <laughs> 26 years later and had a very exciting career that has led me to talk to you guys on this podcast. Well, you yeah. made it. That, now that now you've officially made it. Is it brief <laughs> enough? You've, you've made it to Jordan's pale face and shitty background and my, my ugly face. Um, yeah, you. Uh, I was going to say before we started, you kind of remind me a little bit of Louis C.K., Maybe it's the Massachusetts, Massachusetts thing, but I think he's from Boston, isn't he? Uh, he is actually from my hometown, and we went to the same high school. Oh. Oh, um, okay. So I, yes. I hit the nail on the head. You there, did really right? hit the nail on the head. Um, <laughs> so I remember in high school, he was already kind of like a comic. and I, I just remember he was like writing on Conan, like very early Conan O'Brien. And I was like, that guy? That guy? guy with red hair that can't get girls and is nerdy like it just blew my mind that someone you guys went to high school you met plenty of people most of them seem like idiots right it was high school they're everyone's an yeah. idiot in high school and, yeah. <laughs> and i and i even knew like a, an actress in high school who had been in a couple of big movies and i was like she's gonna be the star she's gonna be the the uh the famous actress i know never nothing ever happened she's like a working actress in new york and then this guy yeah this grad, i mean i think i was a freshman when he was a senior like this guy who's not that funny in person and he does stand up like he's writing for a tv show how does that even work and then i started doing stand up a little bit which everyone in boston does stand up it's just required uh he came and saw me and gave me some thoughts and um, I saw him after he had figured out his career, figured out his, his act. And I was like, this guy's a genius. And then I have followed him ever since. I was a Louis C.K. Uh, adoptee way before anyone else. And of course, then had to take a pause when, you know, that happened. But yeah. So you guys were actually in the high school at the same time or uh yeah, or no? we're four years apart. Like he's okay. He's I was a freshman when he was a senior, but I hung out with older kids and knew him. And you you never know in high school who's gonna become like the biggest comedian or biggest superstar or you know, yeah, who, who the Elon Musk in your high school is gonna be. So it's always just weird. Usually always the weird, quiet one, which is which makes sense. I mean they're yeah. They're artistic. They have open minds. They they look at life and world, the world a lot differently than we're programmed to look. So, you yeah. know. But I think yeah, I, I, all, I was all just thinking show, of that. All his shows are amazing. I think he's like probably the best comedian since George Carlin. He's like up there with Chris Rock. And he likes to do stuff in front of women that he probably shouldn't have done. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I didn't mean to compare you to him in a bad way. It was more the good <laughs> aspects of him. You know what I mean? Well, like here's that. what I do. When I ask I a woman if voice. I could jerk off in front of her and she says yes, I say, nah, let's not. That's, that's a bad idea. <laughs> you say sign this contract. Are yeah. you sure? <laughs> yeah. That's what I do. I say, hey, do you want to have sex? And they say, yeah. And then I say, ah, never mind. I Prove it. Yeah. yeah. You you have to do it. <laughs> you, you then, put... then you go, at least I still got it. Right? Like, I don't, that's all I wanted yeah. to know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a, that's a whole mess. And I have all kinds of opinions about that. And it's all complicated and whatever. And, you know, he it's it's a tough time now like you can't you know it's 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 not a tough time it's like the world is changing a little bit and what he was you know he got kind of caught up in some other stuff like he's not harvey weinstein who is like a yeah like, for sure like hannibal lecter or whatever like that guy's <laughs> a monster um yeah and and like matt lauer and all these like meet like me too happened and it grabbed a bunch of other people and i was like I mean, even some of my female comic friends are like, I hate him. I, I just despise him. And I'm like, but what did he do? And Louis you know, CK. Yeah. They're like, yeah, I'm I, surprised I, about that because like you said, I don't think it was that, I didn't think it was that as big of a deal as it was made out to be like, it, I mean, obviously it depends on the circumstance, but like, 
I felt like if the women were in the room and he was doing what he was doing and they didn't leave, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like I wouldn't do it. I don't do that. But like, so like Bill, obviously if, if he held them there against their will, then that was wrong. That would actually be kidnapping. But if they were there just, and he started doing that, it's weird, but it's but not like horrible. Bill Bird did a stand up comedy skit on this topic. And he was talking about how, it was like about ruining the top men, you know, through through the Me Too movement. I'm, and, and again, like, let me preface by saying a lot of bad things happened and they should be prosecuted. They should be lawsuits. There should be all these things. There should be these people being re- removed from powerful positions because they did take advantage of it. But he did he did do a skit, Bill Burr did, where he talks about, um, you know, kind of kind of the same situation and how. If the roles were reversed, so he he did a stand up comedy skit or uh, event, whatever, like a VH or not VH, but Comedy Central thing. And uh, at one point, a woman that just performed walked off stage, slapped slapped him in the ass, grabbed his ass, and said, "Beat that!" And he's like, mm. "I just felt like I was touched." You know what I mean? Mm. So you know, I, I I get it, and it's usually the opposite way around. It's usually the men to the women. I get that. I'm not going to deny that, but there is some circumstances where it's like, to your point, Mike, uh, was like, like, was it, you know, uh, nobody wants to see something you don't want to see. Right. And uh, if it, the, if the roles were reversed and somebody walked out like Sarah Silverman or something, and she was just like, look at this, and, you know, I, it, people would laugh and be like, eh, I don't feel so comfortable about it. But it, I, I think the bigger problem is that it happens so frequently and 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 in so much more, I don't know, emotional and psychological demise that it, it needed to be addressed. But to your point, Micah, like the Louis C.K. thing, you know, there's a reason why he's still doing comedy, and he addressed it like went right when he came back. So uh, he he included it in some of his skits. So I, I don't know. It's kind of a he's kind of on the border, but there's some definite people that violated a lot and i'm and i'm glad that that's changing i i am i really yeah I, like yeah. he's he's collateral damage and he's also got like tens collateral. of millions of dollars like yes i know he's not making tv money but he's he's well off he didn't like take a guy who's working minimum wage and force him out of his industry and he's destitute like it's a guy who's okay so if it like starts a conversation about like where that line is and yeah, I've seen that Bill Burr skit and it's really funny, but like men have power and especially a, a famous man, he has power. And so yeah. these comedians were in the room with them and, you know, it is kind of awkward. It is weird show busy, like, well, this guy who's got more than what I have wants to do something really weird. Like, what do you do? And, you know, I think I think it was his manager or whatever, his people that work with him that were calling them and saying, you better not talk about this or we'll ruin you. Like there were definitely some really awful elements to it that maybe Louis C.K. didn't do, but like people in his, you know, in his ecosystem. But yeah, I just, there's also a moment where I'm like, okay, well, he lost all that, all, you know, the FX deal and he doesn't have, he can't tour like he did. Like he's been punished. So what's the path to returning? Like, what do you, uh, my comedian friends are like, I'll never watch his comedy. I hate him. And I'm like, but like, as a society, aren't we supposed to punish people and then rehabilitate them and then return them to what they do? Like, he has a special where there's a sorry behind him, you know, on stage. Like, the whole special is just him apologizing, which he did poorly in the beginning. I know he was like, oh, it's complicated. And like learning to accept uh, your role in something like this is not easy. It's not, I was not prepared for it. Like no one taught me, how do you apologize to all of female kind when you've been busted doing something kind of gross hard, and kind of enough to, It's hard enough for me to apologize to my girlfriend for making the dishes weren't fully done. Like Exactly. <laughs> yeah. exactly. So how do, you, yeah. how, do you, how do you get to that? And like, to your point, yeah, I agree. It's like, how do you re, re like so the whole point is about like prison systems and i'm not saying like that was prison worthy but like prison systems and rehabilitating people to be part of normal society again like if, if you're just going to discard it and say i'm never going to be interested in him again or 
I was I was his biggest fan, but now I'm not, and now I'll never watch him again. Well, what if he makes changes? Like, isn't that the whole point of human progression? Is to exactly better and better and better and better and make learn from your mistakes. I mean, that's kind of what you if you teach it or you preach it, then you should accept that. You know that 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 person is remorseful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and he is he is honestly one of my favorite comedians, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that he's just so dark and it's like when he came back after that whole scandal like five years later or whatever he came out and like didn't he didn't dumb his comedy down you know what i mean i don't know if you've heard any of his newer comedy but it's like it's still pretty like dark and um raw i don't even know what the word would be like um he doesn't hold back you know what i mean and i, I give him credit for that have you have you talked to him since then have you like given him a call and been like hey man oh since the thing happened. Happened. no 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 you, yeah, 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 yeah no i don't want to yeah. No, no. And I, we'd like, I, I saw him a couple of times in, in my twenties and then he just became, you know, he, he was bobbling along. Like he was a comedian's comedian. And then at some point, like 10, 15 years ago, he just exploded. Like he, you know, Louie and all these shows and yeah, he yeah. just, he left the stratosphere, but I know people that know him and um, yeah, it's, that's a real, like, that's a perfect example of it's super complicated. It's super hard. Uh, Harvey Weinstein's not complicated. Like he's been convicted by two, <laughs> two juries. Like, yeah. I don't think he's going to figure his life out. Eh, he'll go to prison and find Allah or whatever, and you know, uh, write a book about it, but he, he's a monster. He's a sociopath. And, you know, you like, like Tony Soprano, you can't, you know, you can't fix that. That's a broken human being like Ted Bundy. Not that Harvey Weinstein yeah. mur- murdered anyone, at least that we know of, but um <laughs> Yeah. yeah, like so, some people are broken. Some like some a- animals are sick and they need to go away. Um, pedophiles, serial killers, Weinstein's. But Louis C.K., yeah, being, I feel like he did something bad, but he's being treated like he can't be redeemed. And it's like the world responded to what he did. They let him know that's that's kind of bad and don't do it. And I don't think he does it anymore. He's certainly not going to do it again. So hopefully not. That's hopefully the big not. Thing yeah. is, the main thing is just don't do it again. But yeah, Kevin Spacey is another one that like probably just won't. That come was back, shocking. I'm assuming. That was shocking to me. I mean, he just he just comes off. Kevin Spacey just comes off like a sociopath. Same same with Harvey Weinstein. But going back to what you were saying about the the people who make it from your high school, or you don't think would. There's a lot of those. Like I see a lot of people. Like one guy. I'm trying to think of who I was just thinking of, and I want to say it's like Stavros um, Halkius. Have you guys heard of him by any chance? No, he's a, no, it's a great he's, name. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Does he have glasses, kind of a heavy dude. Like a fat dude, glasses. Like he's kind of young. Honestly, yes. it's like I hate to say this, but he kind of looks almost like a like a child molester or something. Like just by his just by his looks. He was on a podcast called like Come Town. Yes. And that po- <laughs> you know what I'm talking whoa, about. Whoa, 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 whoa. You're on a podcast so, like, called Come Town. Yeah, he was on a podcast con- called Come Down. He quit. And then recently he's like broke out and gone huge. He was just on Joe Rogan. And um, could you imagine seeing some, you have to see a picture of him, Jordan, if you can. Could you imagine being like, I went to fucking high school with that guy and it's now like, he's famous and I have some shit job at like a fucking factory. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, What's his name? Sta- Stavros Halkius. I see him. You know, who he, you know who he is, Stephen, right? Yeah. Oh, I, I think he's hilarious. Like he's, he is. He's he one is. of those guys that's that's bursting. He's not. And I noticed too, like a lot of comedians, once upon a time, you try and get a special on HBO and then Comedy Central will do specials. And then Netflix came along and gave everybody a special and it just watered down comedy. And he's really taken to like making a lot of YouTube videos and he did a special on YouTube. So he didn't get a lot of interference and I watch it and it's great. Like he's, yeah. he's an up and comer. I, I love his, uh, his act. And his crowd work is amazing. Like he's, yeah. he, I think I caught him where he was just in Portland, just assaulting the crowd. And he's like, this seems like a great city to move to and give up. And I, it was like, <laughs> I just fell out of the, my chair and I'm like, that's a great, that's, yeah. that is Portland perfectly. I love Portland, great city, great people, but it's where you go to throw in the towel. Yeah, yeah. He he doesn't miss either. Like he has that laugh that's like really kind of obnoxious and annoying. 
but it's almost like I was listening to him on a podcast recently. And every time he does it, it like just makes you laugh. You know what I mean? It's like, like, it's almost like everything that comes out of his mouth is funny. And like, you know, it's funny. Like you don't like some comedians. It's like eh, a lot of comedians that are on Joe Rogan. I'm like, you know, they're just not that funny, but everything he says comes out funny. I think he looks, yeah. he looks like Ron Jeremy a little bit. He's exactly. got a little raw, a little young Ron Jeremy energy. Uh, uh, what's the show? Aqua Teen Hunger Force. He kind of looks like the neighbor, the uh, the New Jersey guy that lives next to. I don't know if you've watched Adult Swim. Um, I haven't yeah, seen it, but kind of looks like that guy. Yeah. So we we're, we don't have too much time. So I mainly want to cover the, your podcast and then also your life in working in Hollywood as a writer and all that. So yeah. I don't know which one you want to go over first, but um, uh, or, or or what do you want to cover? Well, Hollywood is an interesting place. Uh, I came here and I worked for a British actor in his production company for a while, just right out of college. This guy named Gary Oldman, who you probably know from oh yeah the bat the Batman movie. <laughs> um, I know Gary Oldman. Yeah, yeah, that was <laughs> that was real weird. I just remember being my last class in film school. And I'm sitting in a theater and I'm watching Sid and Nancy starring Gary Oldman. And I just, you know, you have to write, a, write, and right. I'm writing, writing my paper after. And I'm like, I'm never going to get a job. I don't know anyone. This is, I'm in I went to college in Boston. Uh, I don't know anyone this is never going to work. Why am I even doing this? And then a year and a half later, I'm sitting in front of Gary Oldman, like the guy I just watched in the screen. So it's a weird place where you can, not know anyone and just drive to town with $500 and sleep on someone's couch. And then someone just goes, you get over here. Um, at, th through absolute luck and just timing. Like it had nothing to, I didn't know anybody. I just knew a girl who knew his, his old assistant and said, they're, they're quitting. Can you work tomorrow? And I'm like, Sure, I'm not doing any. I'm just sleeping on a couch. <laughs> That's what Tom um, Cruise did too. He was just sleeping on like, um, yeah, one whole, of those guys' couches. Yeah. Before he <laughs> um, and and I worked with that guy for a while and had a lot of fun. He like directed a movie that I helped him out with, or the company I was at helped him out with, and um, I, I like it began my the, the the sort of this innate sense of I just don't care. Like people would, actors I knew, like you get to hang out with Gary Oldman. I'm like, eh, he's just a guy. He's a slight British man who smokes cigarettes in the office. And uh, I don't know if you know that movie, The Professional, the one with Natalie Portman. Yeah. Yeah. I've never so, seen it, but I, I know of it. Okay. So he's in it. And there's like a famous moment where he screams at a guy and goes, bring me everyone. And it's like an iconic <laughs> type Gary Oldman the professional on YouTube. And that will be the first video that comes up. He's screaming in his crazy. And I remember he did that in front of my face once in the office. Like it would be like Tom Hanks coming up to you and yelling Wilson, you know, like something. <laughs> and I just looked at him and I was like, yeah, I, I, I don't know. What are you doing? And he's like, uh. and he's so polite and British. He's like, that, that, that's from the movie, the professional. And I'm like, yeah, I saw it. And what, what moment? And he's trying to, politely explained to me he's doing an iconic moment from a movie right in my face and then it took him about five minutes to realize like i'm just fucking with you dude like of course i know i've got the the poster behind you and i've seen the movie a hundred yeah. times so that was like the first eh, just like don't care and you'll you'll glide through this weird business where everyone is so uptight and so precious and um that's I, the I, key to hollywood Right. It's just I, acting I, like you I, don't I, care. I think it was the key for me. Like some people are sick of pants yeah. and love everyone, you know, just treat these people like they're special. I just treated him like he was Louis C.K. in the halls of my high school. And I'm just messing with him because eh, why not? So um, like years later, I wrote a script that got bought by Madonna's company, uh, a feature comedy thing. Never went anywhere. But um you know, they're like bringing me in her office and showing me her like tour stuff. And I'm just like, I, I mean, yeah, cool. Like, I guess if I was 16 and it was the eighties and a, and, a, and a girl, but where's my money, you know? And I remember they screwed me out of something. And so I'm sitting in Madonna was never there. She was just on email chain. She was touring. 
and uh, they're screwing me out of something. And I'm sitting in some fancy chair. And I just remember taking my pen, you know, I'm pretending to take notes where they're giving me stupid ideas. I wrote, Sean Penn was here on her the arm of her of her because <laughs> I knew that it was over and it was never gonna happen and they weren't gonna pay me for stuff I did. And I'm just like, oh, I hope she came back from tour and saw her ex-husband's name written there and got pit. Like, who wrote on this thing? And like, so there's this like there's this trail of me not caring and just like, eh. Uh, it, it, it somehow has served me, but it like really came into play years later. So uh, I, I wrote on some TV shows and then somebody asked me to help with an unscripted show that became this thing called Laguna Beach that became The Hills. That is this perennial teen reality. Well, I, got a, I got a Kristen Cavalli song or song story yeah. <laughs> at some point, but we can keep going. <laughs> So I'm working on that show and it, whatever it's, it was fine. It was, um, uh, people seem to enjoy it. I enjoyed um, when I left at the end of the day, but um, our offices were intermingled with curb your enthusiasms offices. And I, I, to be honest, like I wasn't the biggest Seinfeld fan. Cause I was, I think it was in college when it started and I was just like working and I, I just missed it, but I love curb and I love curb because Larry David, at least, in the show is just he's like punk rock like he's just just doesn't care he says what's on his mind it's just so uh, it's so antisocial which is just me and like i can hear the song being played yeah. in the next room like this is this is amazing um i think i talked to the editor who's cut you know one day i wave at him and say hi nice to meet you you're you're cutting curb i'm 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 an and en i'm envious of you and then like late one night, I, I was in an edit room and I opened the door and literally two feet away, there's a door for curb and Larry David opens the door. And so two dudes are standing in a tiny hallway. I look him in the eye and I do this. I go, hi. He just turns and runs down the hallway. Like he's just like, doesn't say hi and runs away. Like I asked him for a million dollars. Like it was, I, and I remember the next day talking to the editor, I'm like, what's, what's up with your boss? He's like, he's, it's Larry David. It's, and I'm like, he's really like that. Like, yeah, he's, a, and he, and he, did he produce it also? And yeah, like he's executive producer star. So a uh, couple months go by and I'm working in that same room. And that editor, the one who was cutting curb asked the editor I was working on, uh, on Laguna beach with, Hey, will you come in here and, and look at a cut? Larry wants, uh, an outside opinion. And I was like, what about me? And they're like, yeah, just, just, he just wants a, a, a female editor's point of view. So she goes in and watches like a rough cut, you know, not a finished episode of Curb. And she comes out and she's laughing. Oh, Larry, this and that. And he's talking to her like they're friends. And I, I'm so envious and so angry. Like why, why, why did I get blown off? And why did she get invited in? And then a couple of weeks later, this happens with her and a writer's assistant, like two females go in and watch an episode and they come out and they're like, oh, Larry, that was a great. And I'm just so mad. I'm just so pissed that it's not me. And then a couple more weeks later, he says, Larry wants a male point of view. And, you know, would you be interested in coming and watching a cut? And I'm like, Yes. And I remember I was in a meeting with like the head of the network and I got the, the text like Larry's ready. And I just hung the phone up. I just slammed the phone down. I don't care. Um, more just don't care attitude. And I run down the hall like I'm going to finally go in that edit bay and hang out and I'm going to I'm going to get my uh, my bona fides. I'm going to be cool. I open the door and it is everyone from the show. Wow. Like people sitting on the floor. Uh, the writer's assistant and the editor, uh, Larry David, uh, producers. I mean, just this tiny room had like 15 people in it. And everyone looks at me like, who are you? What, what is this? Why are you here? And there's a, there's a couch, three, three cushions on it. The, our, my editor, the writer's assistant, and then an empty seat. And then Larry David sitting on like a glass table. And I look at him and I go, do you, do you, do you want to sit on the couch? She's like, no, 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 come in, come in, come in. 
<laughs> so now I sit down on the couch. Everyone is still looking at me like, who are you? Why are you here? And Larry David is above me. Like I sink down to the couch and he's on this glass table and he's got a little notepad and he says, all right, we're just going to show you the show. And we just want your opinion at the end. They turn the lights off. And that thing that happens in an HBO show where it goes, and it says HBO. And I remember, I remember, I still remember thinking like, they do that here. Like they put it on. They don't do that later. Uh, interesting. And it dips to black. And right before that song comes on, Larry David falls through the glass table. So the sound <laughs> of shattering glass just fills the room. Like if you, oh, broke, man. A, if you broke a glass indoor, it is loud. And so Larry David falls straight <laughs> down to the ground. His legs are up in the air because it's this like metal square. Yeah, frame. Yeah, and so his, his head is now right next to me. We are staring at each other. And you know, in the show, when he screams, when he's doing the, bah, 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 that's happening to me. Like I'm all of a sudden in the show, he's just screaming because he's fallen through a glass table. So I reach down, I touch him. He puts his little bony hands on me and I pull him out. And I get him up and the and he stands right in front of me. And the first thing he does is he just whips his shirt off because he thinks he's cut his back up. So I'm looking at Larry David's shirtless body and he's checking his golf swing and just pandemonium. People are checking screaming. I know he checked his, he's like, am, am I fucked up? Like, can I golf? And I'm like, he's checking his golf. And <laughs> it's probably the closest thing I've ever had to a heart attack because the sound of breaking glass and then I'm like, I'm pulling Larry David out of this like metal frame and he's holding on to me. It's just weird. This is a guy that would not say hello to me. And so, and I'm covered in glass. No one cares about me. Everyone's Larry, Larry. They're brushing him off. They're checking him for cuts. And then he just has a chair brought in and goes, okay, let's watch the show. And I just, I feel my heart pounding in my chest. And I, I said, really? Like, shouldn't we just all go home and forget that this happened? Nah, 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 nah. watch the show so they play the show i i think it's like season four or five it's uh for those of you who follow curb it's the one where rob uh shoot what's his name he's a comedian he plays a a, 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 a sex of a child a pedophile who's moved to town and oh, okay uh, yeah rob Lowe. no no uh, i know rob, I know who rob, you're rob, about. rob rob cordry yeah um, yeah yeah and so watch the show. It all ends. Rob Cordry comes to the Seder and everyone's upset. And the, sh the, the episode ends. And then he asks some very like pedantic editorial questions. Like, did you know that that shot of that newspaper? Did you know that was my blah, blah, blah. Like, and we, we just kind of nod. Like, I just want to get the fuck out of there. And then he asks another kind of pedantic question. Uh, oh, did you think, did you understand the, the, the relationship in these two shots. And we just kind of went, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he went, okay, okay. And then for reasons that I still don't quite understand, but I loved Curb and I've watched them all. And there's something, something didn't work for me with the show. It was still in a rough form. And so I remember just picking a point in space because now he's sitting on a chair next to me and I don't want to look at him <laughs> and I don't want to look at anyone. The, the room is packed. So I just look at like just a point in space and I say, you know, the Rob Corddry character, you say that he's the pedophile, but you never really know it. So when he shows up at the end, I thought it was going to be a misdirect where he really wasn't the pedophile. And so it just didn't work for me. And then I remember Larry Dave, he's like rubbing his, his chin and he's like, oh, oh. And then these two guys on the other side of the room, older guys are like, no, Larry, like the show works. Don't listen to him. And then Larry David and these two older guys start screaming at each other. Mm. And Larry David's defending me. Well, he doesn't think that they're like, Larry, he's a fan. Don't listen to him, Larry. And then he's, and then Larry David is screaming at this guy who's wearing pajamas and has super long hair. And I'm like, who is this guy? And I remember him saying, Larry, I can't stay here all night and fix this. I got to go finish this film. You, blah, blah, blah. and I'm like, who gives this old guy wearing pajamas a film? The guy was Larry Charles, and the film he was oh. finishing was Borat. So, oh, <laughs> man. So, yeah. And, and you know, the, Chuck, that's why Borat was so. That's why. <laughs> so, everyone looks at me 
And Larry, Larry David is like, yeah, yeah, he's right. And everyone looked, even the editor, Larry David's editor looks at me like, what did you do? So everybody slinks out of there. Um, I go home and tell everyone I've ever known, like, I just touched Larry David. It was amazing. Um, <laughs> the next day I'm standing in my office uh, talking to some, you know, people I was working with and someone taps me on the shoulder and I turn around and it's Larry David. And I, I jump because A, it's, he's touching me again. And B, <laughs> and, and B, you just, I was like, oh my God. He's like, what? I'm like, you fell through a table. He's like, when? Yesterday. He totally forgot. Like that's, that's his everyday life. And he, he says to me, I thought about what you said. And what if we shoot a scene where I tell Cheryl that I saw a picture of him at the post office and we start riffing for five minutes. And I remember these two like employees of the show were looking at me like, introduce me to Larry. Like they they loved Larry David too. And for some reason, I just, they, they disappeared. And we talked about the show for like five minutes. And when I went to go watch the episode, he reshot a scene that explained what, who Rob Corddry was based on what we had yeah. talked about. Yeah. I found out from the editor, no one gives Larry David notes, not even HBO. So I, I of course decided to, uh, I was never asked back to another screening. <laughs> um, but every day at work, I would see him in the halls and he'd go, Hey, how you doing? I go, Hey, Larry, it's a good episode on Sunday. So I guess the, the moral of the story is like, I, I had conviction in what I believed. And even though Larry David didn't ask for me to destroy his show, he saw value in it. So speak up when you have the opportunity. That's true. Yeah. And so one time, like, I'll just keep this very brief. Um, do you know, do you remember the movie, The Internship? I think it was with Vince uh, Vaughn. No, The Intern. No, it's called The Internship. Oh, I think uh, Rob, was, Robert I De Niro. Think Robert De Niro and uh, the girl from Devil Wears Prada. Uh, and Anne Hathaway. Hathaway. So the right, so I went in for, I get invited to pre-screenings, you know, so I get a bunch of, like I was in Django, I wasn't in Django, but I, I went to pre-screening of Django, watched the Quentin Tarantino was in the in the theater with us explaining stuff to us. And so it was uh, the internship um, with Anne Hathaway and De Niro. And at the end of it, sorry, spoiler, pause your video for all the subscribers <laughs> if you don't want to hear the end of this movie. But what happens is, um, I'll give like five seconds... I think that's enough. Um, so what happens is at the end of it, the husband cheats on the wife, on Anne Hathaway, right? And because he's feeling neglected, right? Or wait, it was the other way around, I think. It was someone cheats on someone. And at the end of it, um, they just brought the husband in to be like, oh, I totally, it must have been Anne Hathaway. Uh I totally understand where you're coming from. I know you're under a lot of stress. Like we have a family, let's get through this. And I'm like, so at the end of the, at the end of the screening, they said, is there anything that anybody wants to say about this movie? And I, I put my hands up <laughs> and to, to your point, I was like, I don't think anybody would get over cheating within, uh, I don't know, like 30 to one minute, 30 seconds of one minute of screening time. I think it would be like a whole thing. And so the writer of the whole movie and the one of the executive producers, she was a writer and a producer, an executive producer. She said, really, what would you do? I said, you have to draw that part out more because nobody's just going to forgive someone for cheating within seconds, right? Like you have to show that they were remorseful and they tried to make themselves better to earlier what we were saying. And I said, you have to do that. And she said, well, we actually have more clips, more uh, content of that at the end of the movie where um, she, re I think it was her, she repents and cries and, you know, there's a, a, a coming around and everyone starts feeling good. And I said, yeah, you need to include that. And she said, okay, well, when you watch the movie, there's going to be more and you'll see that and you can tell your friends and family that that's why. And so to your point, it's, it's really you know, you have to speak up because we're all human and, you know, it, it, don't listen to Larry David and the guy wearing the pajamas, right? It's, it's, we're the ones watching it and we have an outside opinion, which is exactly why they invite us in to do the pre-screenings, right? And right, yeah. 
So it, it was a pretty cool thing to see that when the movie finally came out. Uh, there is nothing harder in the creative process than getting feedback, like because you're going to get it. And if you're doing it for money, like for a studio or a network, they're going to give feedback. But also like, if you're just doing something fun and you want people to like, hey, check this out, what do you think? It's like the, the real artists can listen to 10 notes or whatever pieces of feedback and find the two that are like, that's great. Oh yeah. That makes sense. And then the other eight, like, yeah, you're, you're, that's garbage. Like that's, I, I've, I, I've come to that conclusion that, that the really smart, talented people can listen to the feedback and hear the two frequencies that they need to, and then just tune out the rest. And like what you like, you you know. And then, I, by the way, it was the husband that cheats on the wife because she was gone all the time in the office. I just looked it up. But was it, De Niro? Was De Niro the husband in that situation? No, De Niro was the elderly man who uh, was an intern because he had he was like not at a special living home but like whatever he's just getting old and he's like i need something to do and uh it was the husband that cheated on Anne hathaway because she was gone out of the office so much that's what it was um okay but like yeah you need to listen to critic feedback and and when you the real critics are your these people and you can't listen to everyone because i mean everyone can post on twitter say this is right this is wrong what's funny is when i type that in it was like ending it was like the cheating scene and how how off <laughs> it was and <laughs> and how how it didn't really develop itself and and complete you know that feeling and so but but to your point it's like anyone going into those screenings when quentin tarantino was sitting there he was two rows away from me for django unchained and he he was constantly looking over his shoulder to see who was laughing at scenes and it, it it's it's like all these people are like yes sir yes sir yes ma'am yes ma'am right and so you don't really get any really po like not positive, but constructive feedback because everyone wants to say you're the greatest of all time. Right. And so yeah. I mean, in my opinion, and so when you bring in people that are like, hold on, I'm in a real relationship and that wouldn't have transpired that quickly. You need some mourning. You need some crying. You need some, you need to put, so she said, I'm going to add all that to the movie and you know, to wrap it up, wrap it out. And I said, yeah, that, that, then, then it would be perfect. And yeah. you get a and that's you why do you get a writing credit? Yeah, you should have got some money. For I, I, I did say, can can I put my can you put my name somewhere out there? <laughs> can I get the WGA insurance just for a year? You know, something. <laughs> Give me something. Any anywhere will do. Um, yeah, I've heard that. Um, well, first of all, yeah, that's why like Kanye West and Michael Jackson just keep doing what they're doing, right? Is because this is what I've heard. All their wait, Michael Jackson's was, alive? Well, no, no. Like when oh, he was alive. Okay, okay. Like I've heard that everybody, all their whoever works with them or whatever, will just tell them, yeah, keep doing what you're doing. With it. Keep saying what you're saying. No one tells them like the real truth because they're, they don't, they're afraid, you know, they don't want to lose their job or whatever. Yep. But then also um, I've heard that Jerry Seinfeld, he was talking about Larry David and they were asking him about Larry David, how, you know, why is he such a good writer or whatever? And he was saying just that, that basically Larry David sticks to his guns and he knows, he knows what's funny and he won't, he won't give in to somebody saying, like, no, you can't do that, or we don't want you doing that. He'll just do exactly what he wants to do. Yeah, the other guy in the like, room like, was uh, like was said. Robert Wh was Robert Whitey. He's the two executive producers. So it was Larry Charles, who was making Borat, and Robert Whitey, who's in all the memes now when they play the the uh, the curb, you know, ending where you see executive produced by Robert Whitey, and they were just not having it. They're like, you don't listen to him. It work. We think it works, and. I, yeah, I guess Larry David does stick to his guns because I, I I found a flaw in it that he probably was thinking about or I guess I made him think about. But I, it made me respect him more and also like respect myself because I did. they did not ask me like, so is there any, any other issues? They're like, all right, goodbye. Thanks for thanks for playing. And I just said, yeah, I, I kind of want to mention something. And I, I still don't know why, but I think like that was the point where I'm like, yeah, you're your your instincts are are pretty good I don't, i'm not amazing i'm not like i don't nail it every time but i watch curb and i know that this curb needs something to make it lock together and work and i guess he respected that so yeah and so did they end up changing it in the end like you wanted because i actually think your idea is the right way to go but from what i remember he still was the pedophile in the end right it was that he shot a scene with cheryl where he comes down the, and he says like i saw a picture of him at the post office or something that like lets you know that 
he is indeed the guy that that they say he is. It was like a quick yeah. scene, but you know, the editor's like, that cost fifty thousand dollars because they could bring you know the crew back and Cheryl. <laughs> and I was like, I'm sorry, uh, but you know, yeah. So you just made it so they, they pointed it out that he was right. <laughs> yes. I mean, it was a, but it was I a thought, minor note. It, well, I wasn't trying to like change the whole show. It was just, yeah. I'm I'm familiar with how his plots unravel, and there's always they like a misdirect. They like a, but he's a pedophile. He's like, I'm not a pedophile. It's it's another bald guy. It was all about a bald guy who's a pedophile. Okay, so he so he wasn't at the end. I thought you were saying that she came down and said he was, but he was saying no, no, no. He it's really early, wasn't. Okay. Earlier in the show, they reshot and inserted a scene where they established that he is this guy. So there's yeah. no, there's no mystery or misdirect. And then you just you now when he shows up at the end at the Seder, you know he's a pedophile, and that okay. thus every, everyone act reacts accordingly. But in the cut I yeah. saw, it was like, wait, is he or isn't he? I'm confused. So yeah, I actually would think, from what I remember of that episode, not to obviously like get too far into it, but like um, I would actually think, and what I thought you were saying originally was the whole show they think he's a pedophile. And you think he's a pedophile, but then at the end, it turns out that he's not. I almost think that that, that is that, would... that is what I thought was happening when I was oh, watching it. Okay, but then you you made made it clear that he was. Yes. Well, okay. Okay. I didn't. Larry David and yeah, and whoever yeah. was directing it in, reshot a scene. So yeah, you brought it up. One yeah. thing that I think is so funny about Curb and Seinfeld is that they take like really dark subject matters but they do it in kind of like a goofy way. You know what I mean? Like that. Yeah. It's like this guy's like, they're basically making fun of pedophiles, but they're doing it in kind of like this. It's not like a, it's not dark. You know what I mean? Like it's still funny somehow. You know what I mean? Like they take really dark subject matters and turn them into being funny. And same with Louie. I think Louie does that. Yeah. Kind too. of full circle. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Louie having sex with dead children, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> what? You you haven't seen that or seen this that that one, that episode? No, not epi- an episode. No, sorry, not Louis the the show. I mean Louis C.K.'s stand up. He talks about. Oh, yeah. oh, in in one of his stand ups. Yeah. Okay, I don't think I've seen that. But did you see his movie that he made like right before he got canceled? Because I heard he's almost like um, he's almost like he almost like knew he either knew that he was going to get caught for whatever he did, or he was just so cocky at that point that he was kind of just like rubbing it in people's faces do you know what i'm talking about steve that um that movie he made right before he got canceled uh, or whatever? it was like black and white like john malkovich was in it i remember oh yeah i, did. I never saw that yeah i don't i i never saw but basically the, i think the, the point of the movie is that like he is he's dating some like 17 year old in the movie and, and it's like john malkovich is like the father or something Ugh. And so it's kind of like a subject that he probably shouldn't be going near, but it's he does. Called, I love you, you know? daddy. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, that yeah, it's, yeah, it's all coming back. Yeah, that was that foggy <laughs> yeah. period of like, uh, it's like when Woody Allen kind of got canceled and he's still putting movies out and like, Shh, are you supposed to, I don't know what to do. It's I feel weird. Yeah. Uh, are you really supposed to be making movies anymore? You yeah. Know? Like, Chloe, like, uh, it was him, Chloe Grace Moretz and, uh, and John Malkovich, yeah. Yeah, that's a good cast. And then, and then, what about the dude from um, the dude from like the um, I'm forgetting his name, but like from the '60s, he was like raping women or whatever. He was in like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, the director, um, uh, you know, what I'm talking about really good director. He made like Sergi Leone. No, no, like he made. Um, this is gonna bother me if, I, if I'm gonna have to look it up. But oh, um, let's 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 uncrack this. What he made like, like Rose Rosemary's Baby. Oh, oh, Roman Polanski. Yeah, yeah, like him. It's is he still making? I think he is. He has made movies somewhat recently, right? Yeah, but he lives in like Russia or something. Uh, Paris. Paris. Yes. Yeah, he uh, r- raped. I, he drugged a underage girl that he was taking pictures of for like a magazine and took advantage of her um but the, like when you i because i read a whole book about him because i was like he's a great director why would he ruin his career and he did an awful thing but also his the mother was like a stage mom and kept bringing her back like knew knowing that what was going on but she thought it'd be good for his career and then um 
it, it, there's always like just more sordid details around something like he's not just like a he's just a rapist like he's uh, unbelievable tragedies befell him in world war ii like he's responsible for his mother's death uh a bomb went off and he's a metal plate in his head like he's a messed up guy and it does not excuse his behavior but i don't know just like yeah Quint, our, Quint, quentin tarantino got interviewed on that subject um what he said is look when it comes to roman polanski talking about a cr- tragedy that would be unfathomable for most human beings i mean there's sharon his unborn son that literally lived without ever being born. Uh, that's just crazy sense to even sentence to even say. So yeah, he, he, even Quentin Tarantino was interviewed on that, on that topic. Yeah. It was on, it was on, it was on Howard Stern. I think he was defending them. Right. I think that's what it was on Howard Stern. I think he defended Roman. It was either Roman Polanski or Woody Allen or one of those guys. I don't want to defend him, but like I read like a super long in-depth book that his whole life and that whole incident. And then I even watched that documentary where like he could have just gone for statutory rape and done no time, but he still fled. Like it's, it's super complicated. It's awful and tragic, but if you want to know the, what really happened, like read a piece of journalism. Don't, you know, listen to a guy on a podcast who doesn't quite know what he's talking about. I love me. Yeah. Um, like but, Gus, exactly. But yeah. But there's, there's, there's <laughs> a, like, I don't just dismiss him. Cause like, Oh, he raped a, like a 13 year old or f- whatever she was. She wasn't 13, but like he raped an underage girl, gave her quaaludes. Like, Oh my God, he's a monster. He should be beheaded. And then I'm like, okay, but how, what happened? Like what he's not, this is a super successful guy. Why would he be doing this to someone? Like you could just, pay a sex worker and why, have a weird why? pigtail like like wh- yeah wh- what why would you- any why would any of these guys be doing this you know what i mean yeah like you have everything but michael jackson's an amazing example too like you have all the money in the world and and all the respect of people who love music like why would you do this why would you put yeah. that at risk like pay sex workers or uh get shock therapy or like just deal with it and it's it i i love to talk about pedophilia it's one of my top subjects but like they're 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 sick people like they can't control it like it's yeah and so i i have empathy for people who are mentally ill my mom is bipolar and she makes bad decisions because her brain chemistry is messed up yeah should, should she belong and, in jail like no but yeah and supposedly there's a whole like, you know, the whole conspiracy theories where there's all these like pedof- pedophile rings like in Hollywood or whatever. Have you heard about all that stuff? Sure. I keep I keep trying to get an invite too. And they're like, <laughs> uh, no, we, heard I, about your, we heard about your Larry David story. Uh, you're probably not right for us. No, I, yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt that that's out there though. I mean, I mean, I can't speak for Hollywood specifically. Um, and I'm not their spokesperson, but I would say that, you know, any any high powered position you know, there, there's the ability to, to get what you can't have, right. Or whatever it is. I mean, you, you seem taken, everyone's seen taken, right. So, you know, with, with money comes responsibility and some, sometimes that responsibility is abused. And uh, I think, I think it does exist. I don't, I don't know if we want to go down this dark topic, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Real, real quick. And then we can end, but I just saw in the topic, I just saw OJ on OJ Simpson on um, a podcast where he, he said like, well, the t- title said he goes in on hooking up with Chris Jenner and he goes in on what really happened. He, he obviously denied all of it, but I really get the impression from OJ that he is, he, I get a real, like an, a very honest impression from him that like, he just does not think that he did it. And like, he just maybe just went into a rage and like blacked out. I don't know. It's either that or one of his lawyers told him never fucking talk about this ever but like he just seems so like i don't know honest i don't know if you guys have seen oj in any interviews recently but um i try to stay away from him but (laughs) i i mean did he do it i don't know i he was acquitted so a jury said he didn't do it although another jury said on one oh yes a civil trial said oh yeah you kind of owe some money because you kind of did it so I, I just so it's awful. I feel for her and her family and the uh, Ron guy and his family. 
Um, but like, I'm just that I, again, it's like you have all this money and all this fame. What? Why would you do something like this? Like why? Well, that 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 had that had to just be pure rage, right? I mean, that just had to be. He showed up wrong place, wrong time, and just fucking lost control, you know. But like we live when when you have that much access to wealth, like you can go to therapy. You can you could work. Like I understand he's a very damaged person, and like you have to treat your symptoms you have to fix yourself or you have to make you know my mom takes lithium and other medication to make it through life you know so i I, it just it feels like he didn't if he did do it then like there's so much rage in him that he would murder the mother of his children like you need to get help long before you get to that point like just pick up the phone and talk to someone and get yourself on medication or there's just that, that that's a terrible way to let your rage manifest if he did it i don't know if he did it but yeah he probably he probably, probably did seems like he did well, what was his book i didn't do it but if i did this is like what i would have done so these guys actually asked him so what happened on the night he's, he's i don't want to talk about that and it was like you wrote a fucking book on it like you know what i mean i, I was surprised he didn't talk about it so like, why don't you just say what you wrote in the book but he probably doesn't want to misstep i guess when he's talking He's probably just like read the book, I guess. But well, I don't um, think I don't think he could be tried again, right? That's double jeopardy. No, so double yeah, jeopardy. I mean, the only bad thing at this point would be that everybody knows he did it and just thinks he's a fucking monster, which most people probably already do, anyways. I don't know. I don't know what the downsides to it would be, but um, yeah. So, so you also worked with Ashton Kutcher, right, on um, Punks, and then also on Orange Count, and then with um. I guess I don't even know who would have been on Orange County. It was Christian Cavallari on. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. So do you have any good stories from from those or any other ones? Uh, so that was like a really weird show because it was like written, but it was performed by people who were themselves, which was a new thing. Um, like a written reality show? Yeah. Like that was the, I guess that was the sort of first one because I, I was on an hour long before it and I got hired and they're like, we're going to pay you a weekly writer salary, but there's no writing. And I was like, yes, I'm going to, I am going to dick around on the internet all day long and buy sneakers and have fun. Um, perfect job. <laughs> perfect job for a slacker. Um, and so we started shooting it. And so, you know, we would like tell them what to say. We'd have to like, you know, you, you shoot two teenagers getting their nails done in a salon and nothing happens. Like they're, they're, <laughs> they're they're no offense to teenagers but you're kind of idiots i was a teenager i was an idiot i'm sure yeah. if you, film, you filmed me at 16 there'd be there'd not be a lot of scintillating television in there so we're like they're they, they they go to cabo for spring break on one of the episodes so before it they're getting their nails done and we're table setting a bunch of drama that's gonna that's gonna happen and so i walk up to her and i'm like uh, could I just have you say what happens in Cabo stays in Cabo? Uh, and she looks at me and she goes, <laughs> did you write that? And I went, yeah. And she said, it's stupid. You're stupid. Oh. And the whole crew just started laughing. I mean, I bright red, like a child just made me feel bad. And I went, okay, but could you still say it? And it's in the, sh- like, it's in the show. Every teenager in 2006 watched that show and, you know, saw her say that line, but it, it, the writer has the last laugh right yeah like going from working you know <laughs> hanging out with gary oldman and learning about the craft to hanging out with Kristen cavallari and and having the sound guy just bust out laughing when she says you're stupid that's stupid <laughs> yeah so they made me feel bad but that's what teenage girls do even back when <laughs> i was a teenager um yeah it, she's you know not the villain that the show made her out to be she's was a I can only imagine how difficult being 16 is but also then being 16 and being thrust into stardom it's like the, I, I thought the show was gonna fail and I was just making money and after the first season we went to go make a trailer for the second season and you know like they went they did this like meet and greet at a bar or a club or something with all the kids from the show and they had a barrier you know to keep people uh, from getting on stage and i watched these kids just knock the barrier over like i imagine what this what the beatles went through in that hard day's night era like 
and they chased them out of the, the bar. Like they just, they, they just, it, it was lightning in a bottle. Like for some reason that show and those people had nothing to do with me. I just picked a bunch of the music and was often absent due to me being in Larry David's edit bay. But um, it, it was just a, like a moment in time when right before social media hadn't quite clicked in. So this was like, they were proto influencers and kid, kids just saw themselves in them. And I just went from this show's never going to work to, oh my God, they're breaking down barriers at clubs to get to them. Get to the chopper. We got to get out of here. Um, and then watching it just become too big and implode. Like they they made too much of it and they turned it into board games. And, uh, you know, I'm standing at a, a bookstore and there's like the true story of it. Like they just exploited it to the point where it just wasn't good anymore. So just that was like anything was, else, right? Yeah. It was just fun to be a part of like, this is never going to work to, Oh my God, this is in the zeitgeist. And then, Oh my God, this is, we stayed too long at the party. This is awful. So, yeah, I feel like Hollywood is good at overdoing things like that. Like, um, Oh yeah. You know, I was going to say right now with Avatar, but there's only been two Avatars, I guess. Um, well, if you want to sit through a three-hour movie about... <laughs> fake blue much, people? No, I'll... I'll pretty much the same. Yeah, much the same it doesn't thing, look... But water, lots of water, I've heard. It doesn't look great. But so, and then what about punk? Did you ever, did you ever have... Or well, first of all, on, on Orange County, was there, or any set you've been on, was there ever any type of... Like we were talking about um, inappropriate behavior with Beach. some girls, some girls that were um, yeah, maybe a little bit too young. Uh, some of the guys. No, I, I never thought it, it, that was. <laughs> yeah, that I, I just remember like agents like, what are they like in person? I'm like, they're 16. Like, they're, don't <laughs> I, I know we, we present them like little adults. They're children. So, no, I've yeah. never. Uh, no, nothing inappropriate. I, I'm trying to think of like the worst. Usually it's just me, but I like to, I, I, I'm occasionally a screamer uh, when I have a meltdown. So that's, that's inappropriate, but I always apologize and by the person who I screamed at something later. So I know I've not really seen anything. I've not, I, I guess I, I've, I've been spared. Micah, you and I grew up in uh, the town over in Dana Point. So I can, I can yeah. tell you, I can tell you that's exactly how life is like. <laughs> yeah. Like, that was that was Laguna Beach was our high school experience or our junior high and high school experience to a T. Sure, <laughs> just just of less course. money. And then the just hills, less money. The hills when we went to high school or whatever. So. Yeah, the hill. What was the one after the hills? It was the. I uh, think the hills uh, was college, right? Or or is it after college? They didn't really go to college. They just moved to L.A. to become celebrities, and then they just made a show about them struggling to make it in L.A. But they were living in like a million dollar house <laughs> yeah. because they were that was like what is this show they're not but kids their anymore. They're, they're, they're no parents. they bought because they're they're oh because they're, they're, they're millionaires money. from yeah. you know the shows yeah. you know so what's the show like no they're struggling to make it in la like no they're not they no, they're not i wish i was struggling they're, like yeah that. they're doing better than i am like like and they're like 18 or whatever yeah 20. they're 19 and they're millionaires like the, yeah like, I was just thinking about this the other day, how at first you kind of had to have some sort of talent to become famous or whatever. But then, I don't know, around that time, probably about 10 or 20 years ago, you could just be famous for doing nothing. Like, you know, like Paris Hilton, the Kardashians, Paris Hilton, any of these girls, Kristen Cavallari. I mean, at least I guess they're, they are actually in reality shows, but we live in a time where you could just be a millionaire and like have no like skill, you know, like besides just looking good on camera, essentially. Um, yeah, I, I think that's, I mean, that's probably always been around. And I think, like I said, how Laguna was right before influencer culture. So it was like, you stared at a screen and you coveted what these people had They They look good on camera. And luckily they had people like me to add good music behind them and make it look pretty. But um, that, that kind of sums up influencer culture. Like, yeah, you, I mean, I guess some of them do something. They have to provide some value. They're not just, well, I guess Instagram models don't really provide any value. They just pretend to eat 
pasta in a photo and then oh no they provide <laughs> lots of value to me so <laughs> i enjoy oh, 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 every morning when i wake up i'm on the bathroom i'm like oh okay right. you know what what, what, what do i need to buy i'm just kidding I, I, pooping I mean, has never been more fun like i just can't imagine a time where i didn't have a phone <laughs> Like I just, what did I do? I just sat there and just like. Yeah. You looked at the news. You're like, what's important? You're like, no, I'd rather look at this. <laughs> yeah. But I swiped the news and now it's just the same. Yeah, I just, I guess people had magazines, but once you've read them 50 times, but now it's a never ending magazine while you poop. It's a never ending magazine. Yeah. I wonder well, when we else? started that. When did we start looking at our phones in the bathroom? Well, the as pen- soon as this, as soon as we got iPhones probably right as soon as you got a smartphone. Oh no, it took a little while after that for like Instagram. Or, I mean, Facebook. Yeah, you could like. Forever, but it was it was on a computer, so when it whenever it transferred to mobile devices. Yeah, the 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 iPhone and being able to scroll, but it was still Facebook then, and it was too many posts from your weird racist aunt. So you know, it's like not as fun. But yeah, I think it was probably like the rise of Instagram or Twitter, where it's just snackable bite-sized content and you're like look i have the next six to eleven minutes blocked off i'm going to be in here what do you got for yeah. me what which do you got for me instagram turn, which, which then don't turns into me. an hour and a half yeah oh my god yeah. i've been an hour and i still haven't pooped <laughs> yeah i remember seeing like married Mary, so this was before this time but Mary Kate and Ashley is that no 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 Mar- unhappily what was it called not unhappily ever after but uh married with children yeah and i remember that dude that guy, whatever his name was, Al Bundy, would like go in the bathroom and like that was like his like safe space or whatever where he just would like that was his man as pre-man cave. <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of men can relate to that, honestly. A lot of parents <laughs> like with children. <laughs> that's yeah. like, that's, that's my the only part. alone time you have throughout your whole like day, basically. But let's, um, talk, let's talk about punked. I want to hear more about that. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. A lot of listeners might know, not know, because it's it's an older show, but it was yeah. so well done with Ashton. And, and before we go into that real quick, I just I wanted yeah. to bring this up when we're talking about Jerry Seinfeld and Larry David. But I heard on a podcast that like, well, both of them are like almost billionaires now. Like both yeah. of them have like 800, 900 million dollars. It's like just so crazy to think about, you know. But um, yeah, I don't know how much there is more to say about that. I just wanted to. There was a moment after that Larry David incident where I thought I had curried favor. Like we were, we were brethren, we had bonded. And I was like, should I just ask him if I can borrow a million (laughs) dollars? Like, like, because I, you know, I meet you guys at a bar. I'm like, could I borrow a hundred bucks? You'd be like, okay, you'll pay me back. Like a hundred dollars is not that much to you guys. And I'll pay you back. Yeah. But but Larry David's got him. He's got, he could just say, okay, here's a check for a million dollars. Please pay me back. And I would say, Larry, I promise I'm going to pay you back. And then yeah. I'd, I'd go gamble a million dollars. Turn it into two and then give him a million dollars. Yeah. yeah. Larry, here's, yeah. A little, here's a little taste for you. Uh, Although based on the show, he is supposed to be like cheap with his money, right? I don't know if he is in real life, but. Uh, he drove. He did drive a Prius, which was shocking. Um, yeah. Although I think that's when he was married. And uh, when he got divorced, I think he started driving like a fancy car because he's like, enough with the save the planet for my wife. The wife's very environmental. So he was pro Prius. Yeah. So I I, I met Ashton Kutcher and his producing partner uh, after 9-11. And they're like, we're going to do this uh, sketch show with some hidden camera stuff. And I went, cool <laughs> and then i just drifted away or maybe it was i don't know i was just like that sounds it sounds like there's gonna be no problems with that at all <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and so i no was lawsuits. On, i was on like a big network mid-season as a writer and i was like like this is going to be my job for the next five years and then it just started to go you, when you're on a show and they shut you down meaning like stop production we need to fix the show that's a terrible sign so that had happened. And I was like, I'm never going to work again. How is this ever going to happen? Just like when I was in film school watching Gary Oldman, I'm never going to get a job again. So they, they say, hey, we're doing this sketch show with hidden camera. It's called harassment. And I was like, Ugh, OK. Uh, and I, I go to work on it 
and it's uh, it's they're changing the name because they shot a pilot where they had a hotel room in Vegas and they had put some fake dead bodies. So it looked like someone had people been chopped up into bits. (laughs) People come into their room, they see it, they go, Oh my God. And then of course, comedy ensues where, no, you can't leave. You murdered these people. And what, what wasn't, wasn't like a good part. If I remember correctly, I'm thinking back on punk wasn't a good part of it, or at least a part of it, like natural people, like not celebrities. It's well, that's where it started. These were nat- yeah. these were natural people, as you call them, just normal people. Uh, those two people that they h- held in that room were lawyers and they went, well, we're going to sue you for false imprisonment. And so they sued them for millions and millions of dollars. So <laughs> when you're sued by lawyers for something and you na- title your show harassment, which is a, a legal term, they decided we got to change the-, the name of the show. So um I still argue with this other guy on it. Like I came up with punk. He's like, no, I did. And I'm like, okay, who cares? Like, did we get any more money that week? Like, no, but they were like, you know, I still have the document, like come up. And I put a little umlaut over the U because I like umlauts. They look kind of fun. And, and, and the apostrophe D you get rid yes. of the E. You get rid yes. of the apostrophe yes. D. Um, we want to make it look as punk as possible. Kind of. I was like, let's just call it <laughs> yeah. punked. And, then, and so it's it's stuck. And so they were just filming with normal people and they just got rid of the sketch stuff. They were like, no sketches, just pranks or hidden camera stuff. And, I didn't know that. I didn't know yeah. it was originally a, um, normal people. No, dude. Yeah. And, and in fact, during the actual show, like seasons one, two or three, like they had actual people on it. And they, they would punk like a few girls, like whatever, like natural bystanders <laughs> that were just yeah, there there was know? one really well done one uh in the very beginning where it was they hire a lot of people to come on uh through temp like you're, you're a temp worker for the day and so cool you're gonna go repossess medical equipment and you show up at someone's house and you go to the back room and it's grandma and she's hooked up to all these machines to keep her alive and you got to unplug them and grandma is going is that you jimmy and the, the girl is crying and it was very mean but very funny and uh, this went on for months and they're like it's not working and again i'm like why did i, qu- I quit this other show to do this i'm never going to work again and then they said what if we do cele-, you know a, a genius spoke up and said, what if we do it with celebrities? And I'm like, okay. Ashton Kutcher spoke up and he's like, hey, I've got a lot of celebrity friends. Super nice guy, <laughs> hard worker, really liked him a lot. His producing yeah. part, his producing partner, eh, not, not as much, but um, no one knows who he is. So no one cares. And uh, they did one with Justin Timberlake that I, I think I came up with the tax. They're like, they're, they're seizing all this stuff because he hasn't paid his taxes and he cries and that was it like they went this is the show i was like okay and it just it exploded so from i'm gonna get fired to six months later somebody's like brad pitt's on the phone i'm like what (laughs) hello yeah man we're gonna we're gonna steal clooney's pig right we're gonna do it on him and i'm like okay that'd be cool like i Again, with even with Laguna Beach, where I'm like, this is never going to work. To they're trying to break down the barrier to get to the kids. Like, I, I no one knows anything. I I just assumed this show would be canceled and I'd be fired and I, I don't know, I'd go teach pottery somewhere. Like life, life is over. And then I'm on the phone with with Brad Pitt, who wants to prank George Clooney. Like they they never did, but it was like, who's on the phone? Like this show just exploded i don't know if it's the name or celebrities but that was i mean like pink was on it if i remember right and i remember jessica simpson and nick lachey when their show newlyweds was hot and yeah. and uh jessica simpson <laughs> breaks in her like she's punking her husband nick lachey and from 98 degrees and uh she brings in her hillbilly cuts in oh yeah 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 yeah. yeah, yeah it's yeah, gonna yeah. live on their property in calabasas yes, and, yes. Their house. and he's like and he's trying to be a good husband he's like wait what like yeah and like you know it was dax you know yes. dax. yeah oh, I, dax. I, I know dax it was Dax. i was gonna ask you about him yeah it the was very first, there were two uh, two comedians or actors hired on the show one and you looked at the call sheet and 
It's a Dax and an Al. And so a very goofy, tall white guy walks in and then a very well-dressed, stylish black guy walks in. And I walk up to the black guy and I go, hi, Dax, because I'm <laughs> just like that white guy has to be Al. Like, no. It's, yeah. That's, uh, and Al was great. I loved Al. But I just I remember that first day Dax looked at me like. Oh, you're a little racist, are you? I'm like, I, I just, uh, I just, Dax doesn't seem like a, you, you don't look <laughs> like a Dax. And he, he gives off Dax energy. So, um, super. He already nice. had that, like, he already had that, like, woke thing going on even back then. No, before he was no, married no, no, to, nobody uh, cared. But I just, no, I just remember, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I just remember shaking a guy's hand who's named Al. Yeah. And I'm like, hey, Dax, it's nice to meet you. He's like, I'm Al. Like, yeah. Oh, so the other guy is Dax. And he was super cool, super nice. I think he's really he's really funny. Um, so happy that he's a super podcast star. But um, yeah, it, it, like there's no dirt on that show. It was super fun, um, and I, I I really was taken by by Ashton Kutcher. Like how hard he worked. I remember we came to work on Martin Luther King Day, which is not cool, but we had to get work done and I'm, I'm like, well, he's not going to show up and he showed up. Like it's, it's a day off for everybody. Um, yeah. And he's just like, I've heard gotta, that about we got to get this done. He, yeah. He, I've heard he, that. He works, he works like, very hard. He's actually very smart, yeah. which is, yeah. He doesn't seem smart. Yeah. And then <laughs> he, wasn't BJ Novak on the show. Yeah. BJ too? Novak. Um, yeah. A lot of people kind of like, it was like a, a breeding ground for a lot of comedy people. Somebody else so, famous was on it. Were you ever, were you one of the guys who would like actually go out there and like surprise the people like Dax would, or were you just kind of like behind the scenes or what behind were you doing the, on that I show? was kind of behind the scenes coming up with like the, the, the scenes. And then uh, sometimes we'd be like feeding lines to Dax. And then of course they'd go reshoot Ashton feeding those lines. Cause they want to see him like controlling, you know, like in the control room when they're say, say this or do that. Yeah, we, we we would do that, and he would kind of come in at the end, and then they'd film him, you know, pretending to do that live. Um, yeah, which which is fine. It's his show. It's like he's the reason. But yeah, um, and I was there when he re recorded those ridiculous things. You know, he's talking in black and white with his hat, where he's just riffing. I just feel like, oh my god, <laughs> this is. Was he? What was he doing? It, he would like talk, he would set it up. He'd be in like kind of like a black and white, you know, he'd be sitting on a stage talking to camera saying, we're going to do this and do that. And he just starts yeah. screaming and go crazy. And, you know, it was fun when you watched it at the end. But when so, you hey guys, we're at the Grove. We're just hanging out here with my <laughs> friends. You know, we're just getting down. What we're going to do is we're going to get Ariana Grande. We're going to get her. We're going to get an isolator into the, into the trail room. And then we're going to walk in and say, you haven't paid your taxes for six years. <laughs> you almost, you remind me more of like a, like a Jersey Shore guy than, than Ashton Kutcher. Remember like I, 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 I feel like you nailed it. It's just when you're <laughs> when you're standing there with 12 other people watching it going, what what is happening? Like, what is this? Is this? Yeah, he's this is unhinged. This shouldn't be. And then, it, it, you know, it, it worked. So, well, I think part of the reason why it worked so well was because he's like, there's something about that, like camaraderie, com camaraderie between like two celebrities. But he like like the person it's might the actually be pissed off. Trust. It's exactly the, the person might actually be like dude what the fuck like we're gonna sue these people and then ashton ashton kutcher comes out and he's like hey what's up man and then they're like oh ashton you know like it's just you like i should have known but i feel like if he wasn't there and it was just some random dude who shows up they're gonna be like dude <laughs> fuck you like, yeah. you know what I mean? oh it, but no, you don't so have you, the right yeah you made some tv off of me and you know there i don't get a, paid there was a couple there was a couple where it almost got to fights right <laughs> Like Ashton would could show up, like, oh my God, what's up? Hey, hey. And, they were, and then they were like, uh, they were like almost ready to fight. And so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I remember watching one where like Chris Brown was in it. And they, I don't even remember, I just remember he was like with his mom at like a restaurant and they show up. And he seemed like the nicest guy. And I was like, dude, Chris Brown is like a really nice guy. And then I found out like a year later that he like, was beating up like Rihanna or something. I don't know. Yeah, he's not that nice a guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen that one. 
but like he comes off as such like a mellow guy. Like, he didn't get mad at all or anything. I was I'd be pissed if he wasn't mad. I don't remember that one. I, I was only yeah. there a, little, a little while, and then you, they all kind of like blend together in your mind. You're like, wait, what did we do? I, who was there? But yeah, a super fun time. Like you know, you're young and you're just having fun, just trying to make people laugh and trying to annoy celebrities, which apparently is something I'm very good at. So yeah, use what skills you have. Yeah. So I asked you before, I don't know how much longer you want to go, because I know you got to go to that party, but um, I asked you before about like the Elisha Schlesinger thing, but you didn't really have much. I don't think you remembered much about her. Sadly, like jobs that last a couple of months, just, you know, they, they, they're they forever on your IMDb, but I, for some reason, I have no memory. I, I remember talking to her before and she seemed cool. And, you know, I like female comics. They're, you know, they're fun. They're, they're, they got to work real hard because it's a, it's a man's, you know, Louis CK is going to trap you backstage and ask some, you do some <laughs> weird shit. So <laughs> I appreciate what they go through, but I, I it's, I, I wish I had, <laughs> I wish I had a good story like my Larry da- Larry David one about her. Like it was just it was just work. So yeah, yeah. Well, the I'm reason ha- I'm why happy I she's successful. I don't know if you've heard about any of her like recent stuff, but like I know like a, it was a, probably a couple of years ago she went on Twitter and was like, I forgot that is I forgot what she said exactly, but basically she pissed a bunch of people off. And then recently she went on Joe Rogan, and she was kind of like giving him attitude, and he kind of like looked at her like like shut the fuck up basically like mm. i've just heard she can have an attitude and she's kind i don't know i don't really how to describe it besides she's like she's kind of just she just stuck up i guess is what i've heard so i didn't know if you had anything from that but um yeah like i said i know you i know you have to go to a party so if you want we can wrap things up here i don't know how much more time you have uh i'm just uh as soon as my wife comes home but she's always late <laughs> okay okay so i don't know okay well first of all what Hopefully it sounds like you're not late again. Oh, <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't even get it. Uh, it's a oh, no, period, no, no. Period joke. I get it. I get it. <laughs> For some reason, I was thinking sex, and then I was like, oh, no, no, no. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> it was a joke. I'm not, I'm not very, um, my, my, uh, I'm not, that's, this is why I'm not very good at like watching stand up comedy because a lot of the jokes just like either go over my head or I'm just like not paying attention. But um, yeah, so overall, are, what are you doing now? I know you're doing the podcast, which I want to talk about, but then also, what would you say your role in, I guess, TV film is now? Like, are you, would you say you're an executive producer, writer? Yeah, I mean, I, I sell a pilot every now and then that doesn't ever seem to go anywhere. And I've been kind of like working in the commercial world, like as a creative director, kind of directing some stuff uh yeah if i've got to this point where like the show has to be interesting to me or i'll just i'll you know do some copywriting or i'll produce like a you know some corporate stuff like i'm just i I, i'm i've been around long enough that i I get bored by stuff that's not interesting so um i have more i would say i have more commercial work in the past couple of years and then we you know the pandemic was tough so um I, and i and i've really put my mind to to scripted podcasts because i just had like a a kind of like a you know how half the world decided to learn how to bake sourdough bread during the quarantine <laughs> i decided like i'm gonna learn how to make a scripted podcast because i listen to them and i like them and i have nothing to do because i'm stuck in my house like i'm gonna teach myself to do it so that's what I made. I made a, a couple se- seasons of a podcast that I think is fun to listen to and exciting. And I'm just going to keep doing it and hopefully uh, try other projects and try and, you know, I- expand my repertoire. What would okay. You say- and then it sounds like you have real quick journey. It sounds like you have somebody else doing like the voice of it, right? You're like yes, writing I, yes. it. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I have a partner. Um, uh, a screenwriter guy that I've I've known for a long time, and we wanted to pitch a sci-fi show uh, set in an underground bunker with like we always described it as like Game of Thrones but underground with all these sort of levels of of a, of a caste system that's going on, and but kind of couching it in 
post-apocalyptic sci-fi and we were starting to work on it and then the pandemic happened and quarantine and we're like no one's gonna buy this what what like why pitch it and then I, I think it was my idea I said well let's just take one of the characters and just make a a scripted podcast about it and he said do you know how to make a scripted podcast and I said no so I went to the university. It's not, it's not that hard though, is it? Yeah. I went to the university of YouTube <laughs> and I'm like, how do you do this? How do you do that? How do you, how do you, and <laughs> so it was like a burst of creative output that I wanted to do during the quarantine when, when we were getting paid to stay at home. And it, it's, it was probably my f- top two favorite creative experiences. Like I just, I had no notes and I, taught myself how to do it. And so it was, you know, everything was on my shoulders and yes, I hired or hired, I engaged actors to perform um, and wrote it with a partner and then kind of produced it and edited it and even scored it myself. So I'm sort of proud of it, which, you know, what do you want to do with it at this point? It's, you know, in, in true, LA showbiz fashion people are like are you, are you pitching it and I'm like no I don't want to pitch it I don't I I want to make I, well not yet like what I want is I want to keep making it people who have listened to it and we're not who cares who how many people listen to it, it it's been listened to by more than two people uh and they write like I really enjoyed it I had a good time listening to it with my kids I listened to it in the car on a trip I'm like great like I'm just making something that people are enjoying and for a long time, all I cared about was making the buyers, the, the gatekeepers happy so they would pay me money. So I'm more interested in like, let's get good at this. Let's make it good. And let's build a fan base. So I, we don't advertise. I don't ask for Patreon. I, it's, it's just, it's a thing. If you like it, listen to it, tell people who might like it. And I ask nothing in return. And so what I want to do is wait for it to need to become a TV show rather than, Oh, I can, uh, uh, let's get in the room and t- talk to so-and-so they're looking to buy stuff. Like I, I don't, I don't want to try and sell this to someone. I want to make this for an audience. If that makes any sense. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, as like, kind of like, as you were saying, it's not, one good thing about podcasts compared to TV shows or movies is that it's like not, it's not really, I mean, what you're doing is obviously probably harder than what we're doing, but because there's probably a lot more editing and music and all of that, but um, it doesn't cost a whole lot of money. So like you said, you can just put it out there and it's not like you have to put like $5 million into it just to, just to have it be made, you know? And um, that's the beautiful thing of it. And how is it doing so far? Would you say, um, uh, I, I mean that yeah that's the other thing where people are oh we got this many downloads or you know our our we're rating it like this like it, it's I guess this second season it cracked the top 100 sci-fi podcasts on Spotify like uh, is that good. good I don't know it's really good I I don't yeah. I, how many thousands of hundreds of thousands of downloads I, I I guess I could find out but I'm more interested in like are people engaging with it are they enjoying it and really just serve the audience. Um, I was just talking to someone today about this, where the business is so serving the the, the buyers, the gatekeepers. Like I, I have a friend who's a TV exec and she sold like 10 shows that have gone to series, but none of them have gone to a second season, which is terrible. Like shows that are good go on and on and on. And it's because she knows the buyers so well. You know, there's this like insular you know, uh, network that she lives in. So she can sell them stuff and they buy it and green light it, but she's not thinking about the audience because the audience doesn't care what the buyers want. The audience wants to be entertained. They want your show. They want uh, Joe Rogan. They want my podcast. They want, they don't care who bought it or what platform it's on. And so like the, the technology that we live in now is democratized it where you, yeah, like you said, you don't need $5 million and I don't need to like schmooze a bunch of buyers to get my thing to the audience. I can just make it and just push it out there. So I, yeah, I love this world. It's, it's, it's made me so happy. Oh, it's a great world. And um, are you paying anybody? Like, do you pay the voice actors or no? Are they just all doing it like pro bono? 
they're they're doing a pro bono and and uh, there's this guy Kyle Bornheimer who I'm sh- you, the name may not click but you google him you're like oh that guy he's been in a thousand shows and he plays a character in the second season and I was like I, I don't really have any money you know like this is like a he's like don't worry about it don't worry about it and he came and did it and I mean this guy's on HBO shows like he works and he's like I had so much fun because I got to act and I was like, what do you mean? You're acting on all kinds of shows. He's like, yeah, but I, they're like, stand here, put your hand a little bit towards the camera, move your head back, say your line, let's do it two more times, and then you're done. You know? Yeah. Like, that, that's the life of a actor working on, you know, very broad television. And he got yeah. to like, like play and act and try things and experiment. And uh, it was like a great creative expression for him and i was like you sure you don't want to pay me he's like no i had so much fun and i got to do something and i got to you know you got to express yourself so if you guys were doing this show but on a network like a like a talk show you'd be there'd be 50 people telling you everything yeah. to say yeah. and do this and you can't yeah. touch that, that subject you guys are just doing what you want you're you're that That's same exactly right. that same instinct that i told larry like larry i gotta tell you a note It's going to really ruin your day, but you guys are doing what comes natural to your creative instincts without any interference. And and, and I'll I'll tell you this much. And like, Mike, I don't want to talk over you, but the last, at least the last couple of podcasts we've done, people are like, we just love your flow. We love how you guys are just natural. You don't cut anything out. It's just a conversation between with conversation with strangers, right? This stupid thing I have behind me. But like, it's true. It's like, we don't cut anything out. It's just, this is our conversation with people that are interesting, that have a lot to say, that are valuable, that add to our culture, that add to our our conversations. And, you know, we've actually gotten a lot of positive feedback from the fact that we are just genuine, genuine people, right? Not this, like you said, if you go into production, you have like, even not Joe Rogan, because I think Joe Rogan does a lot of ad lib, you know, conversations that he does he doesn't give a fuck because he has enough money um and a lot of support but for us it's like yeah we're, we're just we want to sit down we just want to talk to people get to know people and i think i think it's awesome and i think i think it's a recipe that works yeah i totally agree and no unfortunately no one's come to me and said this jordan but hope, ho- hopefully you're hopefully you're being honest i'm, I'm just kidding um but uh, <laughs> but yeah um Speaking of that, like, I was going to say that, like, you guys already mentioned Joe Rogan, but yeah, like, you think of all, like, the big time shows, and a lot of them, like you said, mostly TV and mostly, like, shows that are, like, on some sort of um, channel or whatever you want to call it, and they have all the, they have 50 people telling them what to do, but then you have Joe Rogan, the biggest podcaster in the world, who literally will say himself, I'm doing exactly what the fuck I want to do, no one's telling me what to do. And it's just better because it's natural. It's real. And not only that, but dude, if I had 50 people telling me what to do or whatever, even one person standing behind me telling me what to say, I'd be so fucking irritated. And that's what it's all about. Right. I mean, that's what it's all about is having the freedom to do what you want. Even on like a fucking regular job, you should have the freedom to do what, what you think is right. And if they think that, what? You know, I was just saying back to what Steve was saying, like with his comments with uh, Larry David, it's like, you know, you, you only get better from the people around you. And so that's that's what we me and Micah like take as as the Bible is like, how, how, do, how do we get better? How do we, you know, have a better experience for our listeners? And uh, yeah, that's, that's all that's important to us because we're only as good as the people that we meet, <clears throat> the conversations that we have. And no one's telling us to do anything. So, yeah. yeah. It's, it's somebody asked me recently, what what kind of music do you like and like genre? And I'm like, I don't, I don't have a genre. I'm that guy. I'm like, uh, just new metal recorded from 2007 to 2009. Like, no, no, no. I, I like everything. But <laughs> I tried to find a like a word, a phrase, and I said, you know what I like? I like music that's authentic, and it it, it crosses all genres. Like. I, I yeah. like my, my rap authentic. I like my rock, my alternative, what, 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 like across all genres. Like I don't, and I think that that, that can be said of, of podcasts and television. Like 
I, I can see a show and I'm like, no one wants to make this. This is not, this is just to be made to make money. And why I've just migrated over to podcasts is Joe Rogan is authentic. Like if anything, maybe too authentic, but like, <laughs> I, I don't feel like there are a lot of people pulling levers behind them, making him this way. Like that that's his yeah. voice. And he says what he says. And uh, certain Canadian uh, aging rock stars don't like it, but uh, go away, Neil Young. You're too old. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't I, get me I, wrong. I, yeah, don't get me wrong. I think like, like yeah. everybody says stupid things, and you know, <laughs> yeah. nobody's perfect. Yeah. But I, I think I see what you're saying. Though. The the audience, an audience, seeks authenticity. They 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 don't want to be marketed to. They don't want to be. Well, this joke has been you know recrafted by 10 different people and it's it's now perfect like they want a, a joke to bomb they want th the person to try and fail and then look at themselves and, and go well that's that sucked and pick yourself up and and try another idea and another bit so yeah yeah and i've heard i don't know if you know who sam harris is but he's like a podcast do you know who yeah. sam harris is mm -hmm. yeah. yeah he's like a podcaster and a I guess you could, I don't even know conscious talks about consciousness or whatever, but um, I've heard him say like on a podcast that it's like so many people don't want to like fail, especially on camera. You don't want to look stupid. You don't want to say something stupid, but he was saying how like so many people have made like careers out of just failing. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, because it's just such a, it's a human quality. Like if, if I say something, if I do something, if I say something that's wrong, um, it's like, or if I just look stupid, basically, but I think his whole point was mainly talking about people on TV shows like Kramer, for instance, from Seinfeld. It's like his whole character was built upon this like goofy idiot, but people loved him because it's, it's real. Like, you know what I mean? Like there's really people it's, like that out it's, there. It's relatable, right? Like, yeah. Everyone's been an idiot at some point. So no one's yeah. perfect, right. And, and yeah. Joe Rogan, I believe truly is honest. Like, I, I don't think someone's feeding him something in his ear to ask a question, right? I, I really don't. Like, you can look at his podcast. He's, he's not. So it, it's just authenticity. It's it's real. It's you're, We're all human. We're going to make mistakes and whatever. And I, it's fun. And that that's why people listen. Because it's like, you are like me, right? And, and, and the more you are like the world, which is fallible, then you're going to have more fun. You're gonna have more fun. You're gonna have more listeners. That's the that's the bottom line, man. Yeah, I have this yeah. weird uh, obsession with the Grateful Dead, which when I tell people that they're a like really, and then they pitch me other hippie bands, and I'm like, I don't like any of that. I just like this one band, and it's because <laughs> they were like, there's no separation between the the stage and the audience. They dressed like slobs. They didn't put on Kiss makeup and whatever. And uh, Kiss has its place. But there's just something about like we we the audience feed off each other. And I think part of that gave way to sort of DJ culture where a person is like pretty, pretty much a member of the audience. They don't look special, but they've got knobs and they're turning them and they're feeding yeah. off the audience. They're listening and like they're this song isn't working. So I gotta change this song. And I've just been really taken by that. Like they let you the Grateful Dead lets people record their shows like they broke every showbiz rule, you know, and even though half the members of the band are dead, there's still some form <laughs> of them touring, like playing baseball stadiums. So like they did something right. You may not like yeah. their music. I happen to, but I'm weird. But just something about like and and, and they sort of give way to me to like the early days of punk where it's like we're, we are the same as the audience. We're not you know, some glammed up icons up here. Um, we're, we're you, we, we look the same. There's very little separation between the stage and we're just singing song. We're, we're hearing what you are feeling in the world. And we're just screaming it back at you through these mics. And, I, and I've always loved that. I've always loved like just listening to the audience. And it, it totally goes back to that friend of mine who can't make a show stick because she just listens to the buyers, you know? And yeah, if if there is a, 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 a one way to describe show business, it is just a bunch of transactional people just all swimming around, all telling you things, agents and lawyers and managers and buyers. And it's like, 
it's lost its way a little bit. You know, people slapping each other in the Oscars, which is a weird move. That's an odd look um, on stage to go have two A-list celebrities smack each other. Um, it's, it's another it's, real, it's another real moment though. You know what I mean? Like, even though it's fucking like, he probably shouldn't have noticed you get slapped, but it's like, he very was tell- really very, angry. very telling how, where things are, but yeah, I just, <laughs> yeah. I, I just love this world and this community because it's so connected to the fans. It's, or I don't want to say fans, audience, you know, people give you feedback and tell you, we like this and maybe we didn't like that. And, you know, you just, you, you don't feel like you're, you're feeding that gatekeeper. You feel like you're talking directly to the audience. So that's, that's kind of why I did this, the subterra because I wanted to make something just for an audience and not think about, well, how will I position this to become a TV show or a movie? Like, I don't care. I just want to make people happy, which is weird to say aloud <laughs> because I'm the unhappiest man on earth. But I, people gave me feedback saying it brought me joy. I love the character. I love the the journey. I mean, it's not the greatest show ever made, but it's good. I've listened to it. I'm like, yeah, it's pretty good. I enjoyed it. And the fact that it it, it brought joy to people during a dark time and the beginnings of the, or the middle of the pandemic. And it's still going forward. Like just makes me so happy. So, yeah. And, and I, and also I tell people who, you know, Oh, how do I get into TV and whatever? I'm like, make stuff. Stop. Don't worry about classes or short films or meeting the right people. Just like make stuff. Is what you guys are doing just get up and hit the mics and hit record and go and do it. When I, when I, uh, so one of my customers is, it was it DreamWorks or Lionsgate. I can't remember. I think it was dreams work. And I was sitting with them. I, it might not have been dreams work. So disclaimer. Um, but one of my big media companies here in Los Angeles and I was DreamWorks, having, right? what isn't it DreamWorks, not dreams work. Sorry, dream works. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know who it was then, but it, I was having lunch with a media company here in Los Angeles, and I said, and "This is through the whole like Netflix change to streaming media, right? And content. That was the big word. It was content, right? And so they, they, everyone's freaking out because they're like, it wasn't Paramount. Anyways, what do we do? Like Sony, everyone's like." We have all these media companies creating content like Netflix, right? So they're creating their own or Paramount Plus with Yellowstone and all this stuff. We've talked about this before, but they're creating all this content. And they're like, I said, I I asked them and I work in IT. I said, what is your biggest competitor as a company? And they said, content, content. And I said, what do you mean? I was like, you guys are, you guys produce movies. You guys release everything in theaters. You guys do everything. And they're like, yeah, but we're getting overtaken by Netflix or Paramount Plus or like, or even Disney Plus or whatever it is, right? It depends on- Or even even Instagram and TikTok, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, wherever human direction is going towards and being steered towards- yeah, you're you're taking the mind share of everyone. And so it's not anymore about producing movies and having the greatest movie of all time. Granite, Top Gun 2, again, we talk, <laughs> talked about this last week, was, <laughs> was incredible, right? It was, it was absolutely incredible. So there are still movies that are being produced that are just like, you have to like, you know, you have to have all of the check boxes and whatever. But there's so many movies that are being produced or TV shows that it's all about content, right? And when you have the content, then you own the platform. Does that make sense? It used to be the platform owned the content. Like hmm. if you were, if you are whatever, Disney, Universal, whatever. HBO. HBO, you owned the content because you're the parent company and you owned what was being produced. You had the control of what was being produced. Now stuff is just being dramatically produced. I mean, look at what was the uh, Korean movie or Korean TV show 
where they killed every uh, themselves. Squid um, Games. Squid Game. Squid yeah. Games. Right. That came out. That I can't imagine that was hot, he- heavy production dollars. No. And so, like that content that directed us viewers, us listeners, or whatever, to that. And they're like, who wants to pick it up? Right. So now it's now it's no longer the the I don't know the produce not the producers of the content. It is the producers of the content. It's no longer the executive arm saying, here's what's going to be produced. It's here's what's produced. Who wants to own it? And they'll bid it out, right? And so it's it's a change in the way we look at media, which I, in my opinion is a good thing because to, to what we were just talking about is everyone is producing now and you can produce on a low budget and you can right. show this and say, hey, this has got this many views or this got whatever. And now all these networks or these conglomerates like Disney or Netflix wants to pick it up. So... It, 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 I, I feel like it's almost a shift, a 180 shift in terms of uh, how media is produced these days. Yeah. I, well, it's I, a good shift, right? I, I think so. I, it, it's, it was described in this guy's book that I really loved years ago called The Pirate's Dilemma, where he advocates for piracy, which I found fascinating. Um, there's this great thought leader named Matt Mason. Uh, you know, all, all the people who started Hollywood were pirates. They were escaping uh edison who owned all the patents on he you had to pay him to rent the camera you had to pay him to to process the film you had to pay him to project the film through a projector and so a bunch of people said we're out of here we're going to go as far away from new jersey as possible los angeles and not pay these licenses so they're pirates and they started hollywood and then hollywood succeeded and then new pirates arrived but um what pirates do is show you flaws in your system you know um music industry was still selling CDs for $18 and then Napster came along and said, no, 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 this is, they're free. And so now, well, for a while we were buying, you know, 99 cent songs through iTunes. And of course now that's all shifted to streaming, but he really talks about the coming of the artistic middle class, which I'm like, Oh, okay. I'm middle class. I like this. And to what you're saying, Lots of people are producing. And so there's a lot more content. It's not as valuable. So there aren't as many super rich. There are no more. There'll be no more Larry Davids who have a billion dollars from a TV show about nothing. Right. But but think about the audience. Like, well, there were only like X amount of pr- broadcast channels and then cable channels back when that show was on the air. Now there's just endless. It's just endless. And, you know, whatever you're into, someone is making a version of that and that's just like awesome for the audience whatever whatever makes you excited whatever worlds that you want to explore someone's probably made that so you don't have to then go to these sort of tent pole places and go what do you got cbs and they're like we got a bunch of chicago shows or something or whatever <laughs> that's nbc um you know we got a bunch of cop shows they're fun like yeah i don't like cop shows i like uh, guys sitting around talking about pop culture, like, oh, we don't do that, but here we are. So it's, it's a, it's a great time for the audience and it's an okay time for creators. Cause there's the pie has been split so many times. It's not as lucrative, but I, I, I guess going through this, making a scripted podcast, I've learned like, it's more valuable. Like you're not, I'm not making as much, you know, uh, selling a pilot with a couple of credits, you can make a lot of money, but it never, it never goes anywhere. You just get paid and it evaporates, but I make no money on this thing, but I've made the show and people like it. People enjoy it. And like that to me is the, the paycheck. So um, I, I might be your Uber driver next time. Cause I don't make any money, but I'm, I'm happy making something that brings people joy. So yeah. And there's, there's so many, what's kind of sad for me is I'm kind of like picky when it comes to TV and movies, but there's so many TV and movie shows right now or TV shows and movies, but it's like, I still am only finding like a very small percentage of them to be like really good, like maybe 5% or, or probably really probably less, probably like 1%. But I still think that it is a good thing because, and I think I kind of almost wonder, I don't know if you know anything about like AI and like the singularity or whatever, mm, but bit. yeah, like 
you basically know what it means. Like, I wonder if we're going to like, I, I almost feel like with TV and movies, we're eventually just going to reach the point of a singularity where there's just going to be, like you said, literally so much out there that you'll have whatever little niche genre you want, like you'll be able to find. It's already kind of going in that direction. And not only that, but you kind of said that it's good for, it's good. Um, I almost think that it is actually good for like, the content creators because it's like even though yeah before there was less content creators so they made more money anybody anybody can make anything they want now anybody can anybody who has a, an iphone basically can come up with an idea and film themselves doing whatever and put it up on youtube and instagram and i think that's great or do a podcast like you said so yeah have you have you been on any um other podcasts or do you know any other podcasts that you could get on that like like would you be able to hit up someone like Dax Shepard or something and be like hey man I want to pitch my show can I can I come on your podcast that's, really a, good, anybody. that's a good idea does he only have celebrities <laughs> though right yeah but I mean it's like you're in the industry right I mean I'm just kind of, I'm more just kind of wondering if you were to hit up Louis CK or something and say hey remember me like from a long time ago like how would these people react like are they usually pretty cool and they'll hook you up or they'll be, I'm too busy, man. Sorry. Or I, I just kind of, I've gone on a couple. I've gone on something called fascination street. Uh, I, the Kevin Smith has a podcast called nooner that I went on. Um, oh, that's, that's pretty big. Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm kind of like, I, I want to, the, the part of this for me is also like, I want to branch out and talk to new people. Like, so I, yeah, I, and and, I, and I'm in no hurry to make to monetize the podcast I made. So I would rather talk with you guys and have a good time, as I definitely have, than try and get on Adam Carolla's show because I know some people there and they'd be like, "Who are you and what do you want?" So th this is kind of the DIY route, you know. I'd rather just find interesting people who are, you know, kind of. I'm kind of new to podcasting too. Like I don't, I, I, I don't have you, you guys have been doing it about as long as I have. So wh why shouldn't we get together and talk? Like, why do I need to be on Joe Rogan's? Why do you guys know Joe Rogan? Can you get me on a show? Can you get me a show? Can you help me out? Fortunately not. I feel like I do because I've listened to some, you know, some of these yeah. guys, I listen to so much of them. I'm like, I feel like I know them, but. No, I, I, I guess I've asked around and, you know, I've been on a couple and it, it, I have a good time and I, you know, enjoy talking about it. But again, I, 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 this is not, this is to just let a few people know what I made, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to just let it be, be what it is. And if people, you know, if X amount of people find it, great. I don't need to bump those numbers up because I need to sell uh, my show to one eight hundred mattress or Blue Apron or whatever. Like, I'm I'm I'm, I'm a true DIY. Like, I'm just doing it for myself. So, I just want more people to enjoy it, and I want to enjoy promoting it. So, I don't want to try and get on Kimmel or or something. Not that not that <laughs> I, a friend of mine is high up on Kimmel, but they're not going to. Who are you? Like, I'm Matt Damon's older brother. I'm Steve, Steve. I'm Steve Damon. You like those apples? Um, I'm the one that came up with that line. Yeah, I do. Right. I do actually. I okay. I, uh, I do need you to get going soon. Sorry, I'm okay, having, okay. I'm having a blast, but I do. Yeah, there's people outside my door. We'll we'll wrap it up. There's wolves at the door. Um, I'll wrap it up with. Um, so yeah, we kind of already went over your podcast. So if you want to plug your podcast, and then also. Any other podcasts, movies, TV shows you want to plug, especially since you're in the business? I don't know if you have any other ones out there that people can watch or uh, music too. Uh, well, if you want to listen to Subterra, you've enjoyed this conversation. It has nothing to do with this personality that you're hearing uh, in your ears right now. It's like hardcore sci-fi young adult. It is not funny. It is uh, very emotional and heart-wrenching. Um, it's another lane that I can play in. Um, but if you're looking for something silly, there's a Netflix show I did called Dating Around, which is really out there. It's very hard to des describe, but it's like shot. It's a bunch of people meeting someone for the first time, but it's shot like all one night. It's very hard to 
explain, but there's one with an old guy on it that is just the sweetest thing I've ever done. And if you want to see a widowed 77 year old go on a bunch of dates in this weird cinematic realm, it's super cute. It's also like 22 minutes. So, um, but that's, that's something I did a couple of years ago that I was very proud of. Enjoyed that a lot. So is it there's reality a, or is it? I, I can't disc- It's so out there. I, I, I can't really, it's sort of reality, but it's, it's a movie. If that makes any sense, it's just watch one. And if you like it, watch the old guy one. I think his name is Leonard. Um, Sounds interesting. It's out there. It's it, you've yeah. never seen, you've never seen anything like it. So um that's something else. Okay. And then all- what's up? Anything else? Like movies and I guess you really haven't really done any movies, right? Not no, I haven't written any movies. There's just sold okay. scripts, but yeah, you you're, you're welcome to uh, uh send me your email address. I'll mail you some scripts you can read. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe that maybe I'll try un- un- unproduced screenplays. They're fun. Maybe I'll try and make them for you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but have you ever thought about having like a talk podcast real quick? Like um, like what we're doing now? Because you, you have a pretty good voice. You're a funny guy. I could see you just getting on the mic and passionate it out, you know? Uh, anytime you need a third wheel, call me up. I'll be here. I, I'll hold you to that. <laughs> and, then, and then last question real quick would be, I, I wanted to actually go more into depth with this. We don't have time, obviously. So how hard is it to break into the industry for one? And then two, any advice to people who are trying, even, if, even like with what we were talking about, Instagram or TikTok or YouTube, any advice that we can go out on? I, I, advice. Okay. It's incredibly hard because the business changes every five minutes. And I think you should do what I do is don't wait for someone to say, yes, here's money. Go make this thing. Just make it, just make it. And as I like to say, like insist upon it, which is a, a weird turn of phrase, but like believe in it, you know, and insist, insist people like this, this needs to be listened to. Don't oversell it and don't cheapen it, but like make stuff and make stuff that you love and just m- like make it undeniable, make, make someone uh, have to listen to it or watch it. But I, I really it couldn't have been, it couldn't be a better time for someone like, all right, I want to break in. I want something like, just like you said, pick up the phone and start filming. Don't wait for, I got to have the, I got to have Pulp Fiction two in my head. Like don't, and to what you said earlier, don't, don't be afraid to look bad. Don't be afraid. Even Larry David made a mistake and had to be schooled by me. So make, make mistakes (laughs) Uh, look like a fool, dance like no one's looking and learn, like learn, like, oh, like you said, Tarantino's looking back to see what jokes are landing. Like, yeah, that's like, listen to the audience. That's what he's doing. Yep. Like, that joke, that joke didn't work. Okay, we got to tighten this up or, oh, I've, you know, there's, there's nothing better than having a table read of your script and you just hear it aloud and you're like, wow, this stinks. Wow, <laughs> I need to, I... But just you know, produce, produce, produce. It's it's a cliche, but it's the best thing you can do. And you'll, as someone who could not edit audio to now, like people like it sounds like so good. I'm like, yeah, I just (laughs) Saturdays sat in the garage and I just tapping away on my computer, and you get better at it. So, um, and also don't listen to people like me. So everything I just said. Don't. Do it. <laughs> yeah, it does sound very good, and I also remember. I feel like I remember Louis C.K. to bring him back up, giving that same advice where he's just like, you know what, fuck it. He's like, I'm just gonna make it. You know, I think he said Francis Ford Coppola had that attitude where he's just like, I'm just gonna make it, even even if I can't get any money for it. You know, or nobody wants to back it. I I I, I did a Comedy Central pilot. I shot it on the phone, and they were like, "What are you doing?" And I'm like, "Just like I'm not waiting." We're just doing it where I, everyone is walking around with a 4k camera in their pocket. Like, okay, cool. Go. Why not use it? Yeah. What who are you was the comedy? For? Who was the comedy central? Was uh, it Elijah? Uh, no, it was uh, Kyle Kinane. Okay. I've uh, heard that name. He used to be the voice of comedy. He's a really funny comic, but 
you know, we're trying to get the budget and this. And I said, I'm, I'm going, I'm leaving. I'm just grab the phone. I'm holding it like this. And I made a pilot, like, just do it. So you literally just like handheld. You didn't have like on a tripod or anything. You were no, just like, uh, they didn't yeah. they, back then. They didn't have little tripods that everyone has. To your phone. <laughs> like I was just like, hold it steady. Don't no more coffee. Cause I'm vibrating. <laughs> it's for filming yeah. him. And you stabilize it later in post, but um, yeah, that's, I, I wish someone had given me that advice. And I wish when I started, it was like so easy to make stuff. And I was just telling someone like, we'd go out with a video camera and I would edit in the camera. I'd make, I tell a story with a couple of actors, but I would shoot a scene and then hit pause and then shoot the, the reverse and then shoot this and shoot that no editing. I do it in camera. So you have to think, well, how, what's the next shot going to be? And how is this all going to work together? And it taught me so much. It was like all this film school and all these stupid classes and just going out with a, a camera and editing in camera was like the best masterclass in like how to tell a story visually that I've ever had. Me driving around with a couple of goofy, you know, UCB actors just making stupid comedy videos. But yeah, it's not technology and it's not who you know. It's it's hours in the batting cage. It's just like, you know, Larry Bird can't jump, not athletic, just look like a ball of dough rolling around. And he would just go <laughs> shoot, shoot three pointers all day, every day. And the guy could hit, you know, it's not a, not an athletic looking dude and was an amazing basketball player because of repetition, repetition. So that's my advice. Yeah. And, and also never call me. I can't help you. <laughs> always call me i'll help anyone all right well thanks for coming on steve and have a good time at your party and um i'll, I'll uh, make sure to ask you to come back on again to be the third host anytime <laughs> uh, hey guys thanks so much um and are we yeah um, good. just let me know when this drops because we have some social media stuff for the podcast so i'll promote you and me just give me a a, a heads up like a week out you got it we'll, All right. we'll ignite good. we'll ignite our street team get you guys <laughs> some promotion and Let's i'll, I'll, I'll send you. you i'll send you this audio all right thanks guys super okay, fun bye. thanks so much awesome uh, fun thank you.